Welcome everybody, I have some great guests, they're also great friends of mine, I'm excited to introduce them. First, I'll introduce Laura Vitale, the great chef of YouTube, I've been watching her for a long time, uh, Laura's been making YouTube videos since what, about 2010, uh, she's got all kinds of recipes. She is joined by her husband, Joe Vitale. Uh, though he's not on the camera, he does have just as many uh, responsibilities and he's working hard behind the camera at the computer to bring Laura in the kitchen to YouTube. So I just want to uh, introduce them. Thank you guys for being on here with me. Thank, Thank you, you for having us. This cool. is really exciting. Yeah, yeah, I'm honored to have you guys, and uh, hopefully that was a good introduction. But uh, is there anything you guys want to add to that? Like maybe explain to the audience something maybe I don't know about you guys, or you know what you guys do outside of YouTube as well. Well, I mostly do, of course. I mostly focus on my YouTube channel, but as some some of you know, sorry, I have like a, a hair in my eye. Um, <laughs> as some of you know, you know, I've also you know hosted a couple of TV. I've been on a couple of TV shows. I hosted my own TV show for Cooking Channel. I've gone into book writing, cookbook writing, which has been an insane, exciting, uh, crazy, busy project. I never thought that I would do. Um, so yeah, kind of in a nutshell, we're, we're dabbling in a little bit of everything. Yeah, totally. Yeah. And, and you know, one reason I didn't even mention all that stuff is because I really respect and feel, you know, what you do on YouTube is even so much bigger than the other things that you guys are pursuing. But obviously those things are things that, you know, anybody would be proud to do. But, you know, what you've got, what you've got, on YouTube, your channel, how many views? I think you guys have like close to a thousand videos on YouTube, yeah. right? That's crazy to be able to say you have that and to have a thousand cooking videos, you know, like that's crazy. So uh, thank you so much, Joe. Is there anything you want to mention? No, actually, I I just, you don't see me on, on her main channel. I'm uh -huh. in, in the camera editing, working on getting things uploaded, website design. I do help a lot with the social media and all that. But um, yeah, it's it's almost a thousand cooking videos. Plus, we have the secondary channels as well. Yeah. Tell me how you got into cooking, Laura, and how you got into food in general. Well, I was born in in Italy, and I was okay. raised there till I was twelve years old. And I moved to the U.S. kind of abruptly. It wasn't supposed to be a move. I was supposed to come here to visit. So it was kind of like an abrupt move, um, and wasn't really prepared. Most of my family was still back home. I was living with my dad, and um, you know I didn't speak the language. I didn't understand anyone. I didn't understand anything. Although I was very determined to learn, and in less than three months I could learn. I could read and I write English and speak. That's awesome. So, yeah, that's crazy. I was very determined. But for me, cooking started at a really young age. And not for the reason why a lot of kids cook nowadays. A lot of kids nowadays cook because it's such a fun hobby. It's, yeah. it's fun to do. It's really fun to be creative. Um, it's also a great way to impress someone is through yeah. cooking. Especially um, girls. If you're a guy cooking. Right. For a exactly. Night. I'm impressed when you cook because <laughs> I know how much passion you put behind it. So, you know, but that's not the reason why I started cooking. I started cooking at such a young age. Because one, I had a family to feed. My stepmom and my dad were working, so I would make dinner at home, even though I was only 12 years old. But I really, I turned to cooking because I was very homesick and I couldn't figure out how to yeah. get to my home since it was so far. So it was over a conversation with my grandmother telling me what she was making for supper, and I was crying and crying and crying. And she said, "Look," because I was saying, "Oh, I miss your sauce. I miss it so much." And she was telling me. Why don't you make it? So I kind of wrote down the ingredients. I wrote down the process. I started, and I, as cliche as it might sound, once I started to smell that familiar scent, mm. it was like a part of my heart was put back together. I could just feel myself closer to my family. And once I figured out that through cooking, I could feel connected to a place and a home. I was like you couldn't stop me. I cooked all day, every day, and I've been cooking every day since. So that's my love affair with food is not so much about creativity and impressing someone, but it's about how I can make someone feel, you know, if if you walk into my home, you never go hungry because cooking for someone mm. is my way 
of showing how much I care for you, um, how much I've missed you. You know, it's my way of showing my love for people is through food. So that's where my love of cooking came from, and that's when I started cooking, and I've been doing it ever since. Joe, you are just like the luckiest guy ever <laughs> to have someone like that cooking for you. That's awesome. And, you know, don't get me wrong, Judy does cook for me a lot, but uh, I love what you're saying about cooking. Like, you know, when people think about some of their favorite dishes, they talk about the dishes that their mother cooked for them, right? Or that they grew up with. And I can feel just from your explanation of how you got started when you cook food. You really want people to like enjoy that food and feel loved, really, which sounds kind of cliche, but it's true. That's what you're exactly. saying. You know, my, my grandmother has said my whole life, she used to say, even when we were children, there was no expression you can't, you, you can't show through food. There was no. no expression. I mean, she used to say, it's hard to describe, to translate it into English, but she would say, then these were the explanations, these were the examples. If it's your birthday, you automatically get your favorite meal. Yeah. If your yeah. dog died, you get something to make you feel better. If you got a promotion at work, you get a celebratory meal. So really, no matter what the occasion, there's something, the food just does something to celebrate it. So yeah. that is something that I, I live by. And to me, I mean, even when we first moved here and the house was, I'm telling you, nowhere near ready to even have guests to hear we had a folding table and chairs, I, people came in. I started cooking and the house started to feel like a home sort of quicker and quicker throughout just doing that. Yeah, totally. And obviously your love and your passion for food is why Laura in the Kitchen is what it is. Can you tell me about maybe the start of your YouTube channel and like the story behind you guys getting from zero subscriber to nearly two million? Joe, maybe you could chime in and tell me about you know how that started and you know how it evolved to where you guys are at now. So we actually met in her dad's restaurants, uh, in one of his restaurants, which was across the street from where I was working at the time. And uh, the restaurant closed. Uh, how long after we met? Maybe a year. About a year. About a year after we met, the restaurant closed. She came to work for my brother and I at our family business. And she says, this is, this is more of a job. It's not really a career. I mean, I'll do it. I'll go in every day. But this isn't what I want to do. I want to get back in the kitchen. I, this, I want cooking to be my career. And so we actually looked at reopening the restaurant. We looked at other locations. The economy tanked. It was a bad time to be looking mm. at a brick-and-mortar restaurant mm -hmm. business model. And so she says, well, how about a cookbook? Could I, I'd love to write a cookbook. I said, yeah, you can do that. You can self-publish your book. Nobody knows who you are. You'll probably spend all your life savings on a thousand copies that'll sit in the basement, and, and you know, water. they'll collect water or dust, and you might sell like ten copies to your friends, and I don't know what you're gonna do with the other nine hundred and ninety. <laughs> so um, we kind of that we scratched that one off the list. Then she says, well, I'd love to have a TV show. I said, all right, get in line. No, I said I'd love to have a cooking show. A cooking show. And I said, get in line because I think the rest of the world. <laughs> And then at the time we were renovating uh, our house, which was an old family house that was already in my family. And I said, look, why don't we do something crazy? Why don't we build a studio in this basement that we have here? And worst case, you end up with two kitchens like every Italian woman's dream. <laughs> right? and, and who wouldn't want that? When you go to sell the house, you'll have the mother-in-law suite. Yep. So then we built it. And it took years before we actually shot it the first It was like a year. I wanted, no, I wanted no part of it. I thought he was not. Really? I thought people were going to make fun of me. I just... You know, I never had any camera presence, so I didn't know if I was going to tank. Um, I just really wanted no part of it because, and this was another reason why I didn't, it's because the world was so full of amazingly trained chefs. I thought, I'm an amateur. I'm not trained. I mean, I make no apologies for it, but I'm, I didn't go to culinary school. I'm not a chef. I'm just someone who has a love affair with the meaning of the kitchen and it being the heart of the home. That doesn't translate well on camera. How do you make someone feel connected no. to someone through that? Um, and he just twisted my arm and just every day he would yeah, just kind of like nudge me. And good then for one you, night, good for you. <laughs> one night after a glass of wine, I was like, fine, I'll give it a try, whatever. So that was when I first met her and she was in the restaurant, I used to tell her, there's something about you that draws people mm. in. The way the restaurant was set up was it was an open kitchen the glass wall, half wall, between her and the audience, basically, the, the customers. And I used to say, everybody who comes in here wants to watch you. I want to watch you. Every time you tell a story, I just can't look away. I want to hear more about the story. And I used to say, you have this thing. You're like a star, and everybody wants to just keep <laughs> you going. So it turns out I wasn't wrong. 
So yeah. here we are, and, and so now actually it's funny because we're now five years in, and we finally got into writing the cookbook. I mean, it was it was the original intent was to build an audience so that we'd have an audience for the book, and you know, we, and now here we are, and it's just we never realized the power of what we were doing online. It was it was that we kind of said, okay, well, you don't even have to rush into writing your book because you're loving what you're doing so much. If you love what you do, you never work a day in your life. I think that's how the yeah. phrase goes, and that's why it's just it's it's just fun. Every day is fun. Yeah, I, I would definitely say you guys are some of the most committed people I've met when it comes to starting a YouTube channel. To like literally have a kitchen dedicated to a cooking show um, before you even have any subscribers, even with the doubts you had, Laura. Um, even if Joe was like in your corner that's still a pretty ballsy thing to do and I've always looked up to you guys for that. I tell that to everybody. It's like, you know they had a kitchen ready for the cooking show before they even had significant amount of subscribers. That's awesome. Now, even with that being said, and uh, Laura, obviously you're great in the kitchen. Joe, um, you, you understood that she could do something with this. There's probably a lot of strategies for growth, for views, um, knowing that in four, year, four years you guys reached a million and in the last year you reached almost your second million, what are some of the strategies or things you guys did um, outside of the cooking that helped you grow your uh, channel, both subscribers and views? I would say a lot of it has to do with think through ahead of time what it is that your goal is. From day one we knew we wanted this to be a cooking channel and that was it. We didn't want it to be a variety channel. And I know variety channels work for some categories, so I can't speak for everybody, but this worked for us. If we were to have our first 100 videos be cooking videos, and then our 101st video was a vlog video, or it was a beauty video, or a style video, which the audience was requesting a lot of that type of video. Mm. If we had put that on that channel, there was a good chance that we would lose subscribers, momentum, and interest on that channel, because let's say it was a, a style or beauty video on the main channel, the, the male audience would just be not interested in it. And so they may unsubscribe or they just may not view, choose to view your next upload, which is cooking again, just because they're thrown off by what it is that this channel is for. Mm -hmm. So consistency mm -hmm. is what that was. We just learned that when we planned it ahead of time that it would be very consistent. When you come to Laura in the kitchen, you know what to expect. You know what you're going to, you don't know necessarily what the recipe is going to be or how to make it, but you have a, a sense, a comfortable sense that, okay, I know she's going to explain this in a way as she explains everything else in all of her videos, it's going to be broken down and I'm going to be able to do this. It was really to instill confidence in people by being con as consistent as we were with the format. And over the years, obviously, things got better. They got better looking, the lighting, the equipment got better. But um, the format has, the been, format the has been the same. Yeah. And we're afraid to change it because every time we even play yeah. with the idea, yeah. Laura's audience does not want a different kitchen. They do not want a different, know. you know, layout. They don't even want us to paint the walls. It's they want the same apron. They want the same cutting board. Yeah. I have to say, I mean, you know, some people might say, oh, you know, changing and growing is just part of life. But, you know, I can relate to that. When I go to my grandmother's house, I don't want to see a different kitchen. If those sunflower decals are off of her wall, I will have a heart attack. That's what I'm used to. That's what I've been seeing my whole life, and it's very comforting. So I get why people don't want things to change. I don't like change because I love the feeling of comfort and, and being familiar with how something's going to work. Uh, so I get why they don't want things to change, and that for me was really important. From day one, we discussed... You know, and really, we never even discussed the format of the episode when we first started. Yeah, I think just before the first one, we said, this is what we want. This is your tagline. This is your intro. This is your outro. And I think we kind of just said we, we liked it so much, I guess, from day yeah. one that we never really went back and talked about right. it. Right. And then when it came to, which is really silly, but when it came to the end and tasting the food, then the very few, the first, I don't even know how many, 10 15 episodes, there was no tasting of food because I didn't know how the audience would take it. I don't know how the audience is going to take me eating on camera. But then it just kind of came naturally without even thinking one day it happened. And I was had to judge. First, I think the first one you may have. No, I didn't. No? Nope. And I remember specifically saying to you and Mike, oh, my goodness, I'm so sorry. You might want to edit that out. And I forgot that I wasn't supposed to eat. And he just said, well, let's leave it in there. What's the worst that could happen? And it turns out 
it was the best thing that we could have done. So everybody wants to know how it tastes at the end. It turns out in traditional media, nobody tastes their food. They oh, just really? make it on a plate and they don't taste it. Very few oh. shows have mm -hmm. the tasting at the end. Yeah. And um, another thing we learned was what sets YouTube apart or what sets digital apart from the rest of the world is the ability to have a closed loop with the response. If you're watching a TV show and you don't like what you saw, yes. you're never going to hear about it unless you're checking your Twitter account. Maybe somebody might have tweeted about it, but it's unlikely. On YouTube, we learned that you cannot taste the sauce and then use that spoon in the pot again, which happens on every cooking show you watch. Yeah, yeah. Nobody can go on and say, hey, you, we didn't like the fact that right. you reused that spoon when you stirred the sauce. Huh. You would yeah, never yeah. know that that's a major sticking point for an audience, but it makes sense because if this is a natural you know, dish of sauce that you're making for a family that's coming over. A you lot of people don't like, like to have the spoon put back in the in the pot. Yeah, and uh, you know, it's kind of a cliche, and I know people say maybe overuse it, but uh, the difference between YouTube and traditional media is YouTube is a community. You're building a community, and it's not just a one-way conversation. You know, they have input into your show. I'm, obviously, the magic really happens because of your guys' efforts and your ideas. But you guys value what your audience has to say. Is there anything you guys want to talk about when it comes to um, an audience on YouTube versus an audience on traditional media? Well, for me, I can tell you that my audience on YouTube does influence a lot of the changes and growth in terms of, you know, just really it's important to me that they know I listen. It's important to me that they know I read their comments and I read their tweets and, you know, things that I've improved upon have been because of the of my audience. A, a very classic example is that in the very beginning of Laura in the Kitchen when I would use an alcohol in food, mm. didn't think very much of it. Well, I started hearing from my audience that they really would prefer if I gave them a suggestion if they couldn't use alcohol. So I started doing that and that's been something that has benefited my channel in an amazing way. It's so respected when I use wine in a recipe but I say hey listen if you don't want to use it use a little bit of vegetable stock instead. It won't do this, it'll be fine, you know whatever and so on and so forth. So now they know that I take their considerations to heart and I really listen and therefore it creates that bonding between myself and them. You know, it's like you said, it's part of that feel like a community. They feel like we're we're in this together because I'm not I'm not blind and I'm not dumb. I know that without them watching, there would be no future for me in this mm -hmm. in this in this world in this field. So it's important to me that they feel like they I hear, I listen. You know, this is a community. It's not a one-way street. It's not a one-way conversation. Now yeah. it's a little bit different on traditional media because I don't know. Mm, yeah. Yeah. In Laura's case, a lot of her built-in online you know audience followed her to TV, so we did hear a lot. Right of the reaction on Twitter and on social media, but that's not the audience that came as a result of traditional media. Most of them would be silent because we have no way of hearing from them. They may not know that they can hop on Twitter and and right. at Laura's Kitchen and get in touch with her. You right. know what I mean? The only thing yeah. that I that that I do that kind of makes me sleep at night is just knowing that I if I'm authentic if on television, as authentic as I am on my YouTube channel all will it all will it will all work out and I know that my followers you know my audience from my YouTube channel follows me on my TV show so if I'm doing something wrong or something different they're more than okay with letting me know and I really rely on that I rely on knowing okay you guys don't mind that it's a different kitchen that made me feel better mm -hmm, so mm -hmm. I'm not really able to hear from the audience that's never seen me before but it's again, it's that community that follows me onto my TV show and then tweets me and says, "Great job! I love this. You're the same on the show as you are on your own show." And that, to me, is is my most valuable asset: is being able to be authentic and having the audience see that. Yeah, and a good point um, to bring up the fact that uh, when somebody or uh, many people make a suggestion or a request on YouTube, you guys are able to adjust to what your audience preferences are typically like in traditional TV they'd have to wait till the seasons over maybe create a whole new show and that's what I've always thought of YouTube 
as being uh, strong compared to traditional media. The fact that you can adjust so quickly and you're not dealing with so many different people making that decision. It's you as the uh, content creator doing it. Um, obviously in your case, both you and Joe. Now I had another question that goes along with some of your guys' uh, YouTube success. You guys are coming up on almost a thousand videos. You've been doing this for over five years now. Do you guys um, have uh, anything you want to talk about at like the progression of your production of Laura in the Kitchen. I remember watching your videos when it wasn't even HD, it was still like a square box. Uh, do you want to talk about that, the evolution of your production? Yeah, so the first, so I, I don't come from a uh, film background. I don't, I don't know anything about it, didn't know anything about it. And so if you asked me five years ago, five or six years ago, what color temperature meant, I would look at you like you had two heads. I wouldn't know what you're talking about. I'd say color doesn't have a temperature. So as the years went on, we learned more about film. A couple of my friends in college were film and video majors, and I used to pick their brains as we went. But when we, when we first started out, those first few episodes, we actually shot them on a Canon uh, Coolpix camera, I believe it was. It was an, an old camera that happened to have a video feature wow. because we didn't want to invest in equipment for the show. We already invested in the kitchen, but the kitchen kind of had an alternate purpose yeah. where we didn't want to go out and buy a bunch of expensive equipment until we knew that Laura wasn't going to freeze up on camera. We actually shot a video before the first episode, which was an announcement video uh. saying that there were more to come, <laughs> and it was the worst experience of Laura's life on <laughs> up until that moment having anything to do with the camera. I would love to see that video. Did no, you, you will it? never see oh, that I video. Oh, I have it somewhere. Yeah. Oh. So she did it. She, she just couldn't do it. In fact, we had I had to give her a cucumber and a knife and tell her, chop this cucumber and try to read that line again. And, and it worked. She couldn't yeah. do it without having something going on in the kitchen. Mm -hmm. So once we realized that if you're doing something and explaining it, you can do it, but you just mm -hmm. can't stand there and read a script from memory, we realized we may be, this may work. And it ended up after just the first video. It just worked. She was explaining yeah. it the whole time. It was coming through. And you can see the quality was pretty horrible in the first few, I guess it was the first, oh, wow. well, it was a few hundred, I guess the first hundred or so. Yeah. So we immediately went to a camcorder after we realized that people were interested in Laura's personality and her recipes. And now today, five years later, where are you guys? I imagine your equipment has gotten better, but even maybe your lighting, your sound, and I've seen some of your Instagram posts, uh, Joe. I mean, your equipment is top notch now in, in the YouTube world standards, at least. Yeah, we um, so we still we, we have we went from uh, a Home Depot uh, spotlight, you know, one of the lights you use for construction, yeah. to built-in lighting grids in the ceiling with you know built-in lights in the room, which was the original intent was to make this a flip the lights on and start right. shooting type of studio room, and now it is. And um, so over the years we progressed in that, and all the lights are the right temperature. So I don't know if anybody's seen the vanilla uh, raspberry buttercream cupcakes, you'll see that the video is blue throughout half of it, and it turns yellow throughout the other half because we didn't have the right lighting in the room. Mm -hmm. So now we do. And we started shooting in HD early on because we realized that just like no. television, most people don't want to watch standard definition. They want to watch HD. So we wanted to please the audience any way we could, and we just moved over to HD well before. I think it was when YouTube just started ingesting HD uploads. I mean, we were, we were one of the first to do it because we wanted to make sure that these had a longer life. And I guess we should start 4K soon because yeah. eventually no one's going to want to watch 1080p. <laughs> sure. And, you know, with that being said, one of the reasons why we even have this channel is not only to hear your story, um, but also to hear your advice for other um, cooking channels and even just YouTube channels getting their start. What would be some of your tips and tricks um, or your advice for people that are just starting out totally fresh like you did five years ago? You know, when it comes to, to food channels in particular, and of course this, this advice will be for anyone, no matter yeah. what your interest is. The most important ingredient in this whole situation is authenticity. Yeah. For me, I cook and share recipes I truly eat. When the camera goes off, we sit down and we eat that meal because to me that's incredibly important. I don't want to share something with you that I'm not really going to eat because that that's just not that's not me. Authenticity is extremely important but also you have to be dedicated to it you have to be consistent you can't expect to upload something today 
and then upload something a month from now and that's going to be a way to grow an audience. It's not going to be a way to grow your audience. You have to be consistent. You have to be authentic in what you do. Um, those are the most important things to me. And it can feel discouraging when you're first starting out. You have no followers. You don't know, you know how you're going to grow this. But just stick with it because if it's something you really are passionate about, you will keep going. Like to me, no. the fact that I didn't have a thousand subscribers when I first started, it didn't mean anything to me. Everyone starts somewhere. So, and I also knew that I wasn't going to have a viral channel. My channel was not going to be a channel you go to for viral videos. So I knew it was going to take a lot of dedication, a lot of hard work, and a lot of authenticity in order for it to grow. And that's that's been the only way we've grown. You know, we don't we don't we've never done big collaborations with big YouTubers because mm -hmm. I wanted people to find me in an authentic way. If you found me at a you know from a related video or just in search, I wanted you to stick around because you like what you saw. You didn't feel like you were forced to be here. So no matter what field you're in, just stay consistent. Whatever you're doing, it can be a channel about googly worms. I don't really care. But if you're passionate about that, stick with it. Because there's no way of knowing whether something is going to work or not until you do it and stick with it. That you could you could write a book just based on that last little rant of yours. That was awesome. Thank you so much. Now, Joe, on the other side, like the tech side, maybe the editing side, the production side, do you have any tips for uh, new YouTubers? Yeah. So absolutely. 100% authenticity because if you're the guy behind the scenes and the person isn't really into what they're doing, forget it. I can't I can't fix if you're not really into yes. it. So like we see a lot of channels where they just don't succeed and you can mm -hmm. tell it's because the person one like let's say you you shouldn't be hosting a cooking channel if you haven't if you don't know how, if you've never cooked before, right? No. You're going to cut yourself. You're going to lose a finger. Don't do that. Uh, you shouldn't be doing an automotive channel if you've never held a wrench before. There's just a lot of people who get into it because they want to get into it and make this big thing. Pick a topic that you're really into. Something everybody knows. Everybody's an expert in something. That should be your pa if that's your passion. That's what you should be using video for. You shouldn't be using it just to build an audience for something that you kind of sort of think might work. Yeah, like just to get popular to right. get famous. Yeah. Because you see that and there's never succeed. You see the ones where the people are doing it and it's just sort of a hey, I heard that they did this and it's a great business model. I'm going to go do it. There's business and then there's passion, and when they both collide, that's when you have a great combination. Now, from the technical side, looking back on it, I would say don't be afraid to invest up front. That was one thing that we kind of skimped out on. I mean, we obviously we built the studio, but then when it came to equipment, I should have asked all the questions that I waited a year to ask. I should have asked those up front. What lighting should I have? I should have had a DP come in and just light the place for me. Get the equipment, yeah. even if it's yeah. not as high end as what the DP is going to tell you. Just make sure it's you know something that will do the job, and then get the equipment because there's a lot of our, our first videos. I mean, the video quality progression tells a story, and it's a great story. But it would be great if Bruschetta was shot in right. HD at the same quality that we shoot today. So I would say just don't be afraid and try. You know, it's hard to say because it is expensive to get these things started right off the bat, especially if you're investing in all your equipment at one time. Pick and choose the right equipment, whatever you can afford in the beginning, to get it off the ground in, in a, a way that you don't look back and go, oh, man, I wish we did that differently. It's, you know, it can be something, you know, if you have to, for example, choose a good camera with a good mic instead of worrying about your background. Your background could be a white mm -hmm. curtain for all I care, but if I can hear you clearly and I can see what you're doing, it'll all fall into place. So sort of pick and choose in the right areas where you're going to invest and, and invest in things that make a difference. To me, if I could go back, I would invest in a better camera and I would wear a mic <laughs> in the very wow. beginning because I know that the, the sound is muffled, it's not as clear, the lighting isn't very good so you're not even able to see the true colors of the ingredients. Looking back, that's something that we would have definitely, definitely upgraded. Um, we would have started out with just better product, you know, in, in our production, we would have started out in the beginning with better equipment. But we really, in, in all honesty, we chose to invest in our kitchen because we knew we needed one. Because our kitchen upstairs, you know, our actual kitchen was just so not equipped for filming. I mean, it was the wrong size, the wrong shape. That doesn't, that's not saying that it was, it wouldn't work. 
but it would just be very uncomfortable when you have just one person doing this. Yeah. I mean, it would have to be a lot of stop and restart and having absolutely no prior background into filming or editing or production. We didn't know where to start. So we thought starting with a fresh kitchen that was just a very, it was almost like a blank canvas would have been the easiest way to do it. And it was. Yeah. So if you're going to invest, just make sure you invest in the right things that, that make the difference. Yeah, totally. No, great advice. Um, I agree with so many, and I've even learned a couple things just from what you guys mentioned. Um, but I love how both of you agreed. It all starts with what you're passionate about. You know, what what is it that you're going to talk about? Make sure not only that it's something you're knowledgeable about, but that you'll want to talk about even when you don't have a thousand subscribers. Um, great advice. Um, with that being said, there are a few more questions. Uh, you know, you guys have multiple channels. And I know that, I mean, no one would probably give the advice of starting multiple channels, but can you give us some workflow tips of how you guys are able to keep Laura in the kitchen going, uh, Vitaly style, uh, the Vitalis, as well as all your other stuff? Like, what are things that you guys do to be able to stay consistent with your um, different platforms that you guys are pushing on top of all the social stuff as well? Well, you know, Laura in the Kitchen is our primary home. Laura mm -hmm. in the Kitchen is the heart of it all. We're very consistent on that channel. If you are subscribed to that channel, you know that three days a week there's going to be a new episode for you. When it comes to our other channels, you know, they started just because the audience was, you know, I could hear the audience saying, yeah. we want to know your beauty tips because I'm a girly girl, always have been. I've always had, my, you know, I've always had my little beauty room and people knew that from social media and just seeing different snippets, of, you know, in Lauren the Kitchen. So I really wanted to feel connected to my female audience on a different level. So I started Vitaly Style. However, I don't really broadcast it on Laura in the Kitchen because I know that it can be a turnoff for a lot of people that are not there to listen, you know, to me talk about come subscribe over here. So we don't really broadcast it on that channel. We just do it. We just did it because it's, it's a fun hobby. I really enjoy it. I get to connect with my female audience and it's really fun. Same thing for the Vitalis. It's just about giving people, giving our audience a little bit more of an insight of who we are as humans on an everyday basis, on a daily basis, I should say. Um, and the people who really were interested and wanted to know kind of followed us there. But they also know that those two channels are hobby channels. They're not going to be every day or even every other day. It's going to be consistent knowing that a couple times a week you will find the video on both of those channels because. That's just the way we've always been, uh, but they also know that it's not our primary focus, yeah. and, and that's something that's been it's been that way. This goes back to the channelizing. You don't want to put vlog videos up on your right. main channel. Yeah. yeah. Although, again, I've seen people do this, and it's, and it's worked, worked for them. And I, I don't, I just don't. I've seen it also. Not, I've seen it not work more often than I've seen it work, because yeah. the audience was asking for fashion, beauty, style, girly stuff. So we actually, to be completely uh, honest about it, we actually created a channel in between called Laura's Topics. And we would just do different videos of different topics to see which topics people were most interested in. And it turned out that it was the fashion, beauty, style, lifestyle type stuff. And then we started the vlog channel around what we thought would be a really exciting time in our lives to start sharing. Yeah, with totally. And that was when we started with the TV world and the book. There were so many things that we, we realized this is a really cool time Let's share it. You know, everybody here wants to know more. And we actually tried blogging for a little while. And it was that hard. it was hard. It's it's like you're a video star. Go in the video. Go hard. do the video thing. So that's why vlogging actually it, it really you really feel connected when you vlog with your audience. It's it's really an it's an amazing feeling to open up the comments and see people their to just watch their experiences and and see what they're saying about, oh, I had that same thing happen to me, or I totally disagree with Joe on this. Okay, right. fine. We're allowed to disagree. Wait, did anybody ever disagree with me? Probably. No, nobody's never disagreed. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't know anything about that. So, uh, but <laughs> I, I will say you guys are probably the masters of consistency, and I always tell people second to that first uh, tip of being passionate and doing something you love, you've got to be consistent. Now, you guys have been so consistent over the last five years. What are some of your tips or advice 
pieces of advice for staying consistent, whether it's workflow or you know like um, you know production, um, because you and I both know that it's so important to the success of a channel, especially in the beginning. Um, what do you have to say about that? Prioritize. That's yeah. my biggest tip. Is prioritize what's most important. And I know that's gonna sound really silly, but for me, when I wake up in the morning, okay. I think to myself, okay, where am I going to be for lunch today? I'm going to be home. Okay, great. I have leftovers I can eat. I'm set. If I know that in life, if I know that I'm going to be fed at all times, I'm happy. I can go on. That's a big priority of mine, okay? Laura in the kitchen is a big priority in my business, in my life, because it is my, it's both of our business at this point, and it's something that gives me great joy. Um, and once I once those priorities are in line, everything will work itself out. Well, I think there's a lot of behind the scenes to stuff me, too that, right. that, that goes on that a lot of people don't realize. For Laura in the kitchen, there's recipe writing and recipe testing because you don't want to show up on video and say this is how you make this and you thought it was one cup when it was really one That's and a half. That's not how it works. It's got to be perfect before you go in. Otherwise, you're not going to have the right result. Right. And a lot of people don't understand. Uh, recipe testing is an interesting term that we didn't understand the term much until we got into this business. Mm -hmm. It doesn't mean that you're going in for the first time and making the recipe before you get on camera. It just means you're going to go make it and measure it and make sure it is what it's supposed to be when you go to redo it on camera. Right. So, Because a lot of people think when they hear recipe testing, they think that means that you're making it for the first time. Yeah. Not, nothing Laura makes on, on camera is the second time right. she's ever made it. It's that she's gone and actually got the measurements right before she goes to assemble it right. for the camera. But there's a lot of that that goes on behind the scenes and and that stuff, it, that's all about the priorities. You Priority. have to prioritize your What's shoots. What's important to you? That's how I look at it. For, you know, for me, make certain things your priority. Whatever they are, they should be your priority. I have a few priorities every day. One, make sure I'm well fed. Two, make sure <laughs> I work out every morning. That is a priority of mine. It is, it's been for years and I'm consistent with it because it's something that I, you know, if I have to be in New York at 10 a.m. and have to leave my house at 7, I'll get up at 4.30 to make sure I can work out. That's a priority of mine. Making sure that the recipes are written and ready and tested for Laura in the kitchen is a priority of mine. Everything else isn't as important as that. So once I have that done, I'll work on the other things. To you, your kids are your first priority. Once you know that they are fed, they're clean, they're healthy, they're happy, everything else will fall into place. Work on your priority first, and it kind of like I said, and everything else will fall into place. I think if no. you put importance on things that aren't important, like that TV show will be there tomorrow. So turn that off and go film the video. Go Unless edit it's it. Laura's TV show. Unless it's my TV show. <laughs> turn on the TV. So yeah, I mean that advice is probably good uh, just in life. You know what you prioritize in life is what you're going to get the most out of. Um, you know this is a big one, especially these days. So many people look at YouTube as a potential career. When did you guys finally realize you know this could become a full time job or career? And when did that transition happen for you? And what tips would you have for people that would want to create a uh, YouTube career? Well, I think the first tip is never plan on it. That's the first tip. We know people personally and people we've seen do this where they just say, all right, this is my thing. I'm going to go do this. And you can't. There's no guarantees. Mm -hmm. The platform mm -hmm. is not a guarantee. You, if you're not following your passion, you're not building the audience and you're not consistent, you're not doing everything you can possibly be doing. Everything. It, you're not guaranteed a success, but your your odds are much better if you're doing everything the right way. But I certainly wouldn't say I would certainly say never plan on just saying, oh, I'm gonna quit my job in a year because I'm gonna no. do this. We never planned on this as being I'm gonna quit my job and do this. Mm -hmm. The only reason we left our jobs to do this is because I, we were I missing left, too much time at right. work. So I, I left because to do I it. it was taking I mean, I, it had gone to a point where I was working from 5 a.m. to 5 p.m. I'd come home, I cook, I clean, I test recipes, and I would film in the evenings when we would come home from work. And it got to a point where my body shut down from exhaustion because I was working so much. And it, you know, financially, 
it made sense that, I'd stay, that I would stay home and totally focus on Laura in the Kitchen 100%. And that's when we were able to upload every day. We were able to really up the production of our show and upload more because I could stay home and test and cook and, and do all those things. But for him, it took a year and a half. It was a year and a right. half later. What, what ended up happening with my situation, I was working as an engineer for a defense contractor. And defense contractors, are they typically have very strict rules on the amount of time yeah. you can take off. And... Um, they did. They had a strict rule on how much time you could take off, and I started. I actually took off more time than I was supposed to because we had different meetings in New York at, for all kinds of meetings and travel. travel. And you know, if I'm taking off to go to Los Angeles for a week, well, guess what? That's half your vacation for the year. So it got to the point where I wanted to not burn a bridge with my employer, and I said it's time that I go ahead and take this on full time because if I don't do it now, I'm going to have kids in five years. There's no way I'm going to be able to take this type of risk. Right. So you really, it's different for everybody. You have to evaluate it. You have to look at the trajectory. You don't necessarily have to wait until it, it makes total sense on paper, but you really have to be somewhat sure. Right. I mean, of course, there are people who, they don't, I mean, it really depends. I know people who would say, oh, I don't really care. You know, I'll just go get a different job if I yeah. go do this. But like I said, don't plan yeah. on it. No, I would yeah. say never plan on it. If it happens, it's fantastic. But yeah, and these days it's even harder to even go into YouTube and plan. I mean, like you said, you shouldn't even plan. But if you're trying to plan to make it a full-time cure, what I suggest to people is let it enhance what you're already doing. So yeah. say you wanted to create a cooking book. YouTube channels or YouTube videos can enhance your book, right? Like it can be a great uh, follow-up to your book by helping you build a community around the uh, the people that buy your cooking book, right? Um, you know, I look at YouTube as just a platform um, or a, a tool for any business to utilize. Um, me specifically in real estate, you know, I, I'm not going to quit my real estate to do uh, real estate videos for full time, but I could use the free platform that YouTube provides for you to enhance what I was already doing. So, yeah, that's, that's a, a great, great way to look at it. In in Laura's case, we didn't when we started YouTube, there was no such thing as a partner program, or at least we weren't aware of it. We got into it because we wanted to enhance the website, LauraInTheKitchen.com. We wanted to be able to have video recipes, which we felt was a void at the time that needed to be filled. There weren't very many good video recipe websites. Actually, I don't think there were many. There were really any. I mean, it was all print and uh, and text. And we said, well, why don't we try to do this in a video format? Because it's so much easier to follow along in a video. And, um, and that was really also, how we started it. I also think it varies on on what you're doing. So for someone like Joe, he was an electrical engineer, so a YouTube cooking show wasn't really going to enhance what he was doing, so it just made sense at that time. Now, if you were in real estate, you can use this tool to benefit your existing business and help it grow and ex expand it to something else, and you know it's it can be such a valuable tool. So it, it depends on your career, or it depends yes. on what you're doing. It, it totally depends on on your career path and what you're doing, and it might not necessarily mean like for someone mm -hmm. in real estate, you might show less houses, but you're working on this tool that goes hand in hand with mm -hmm. that business and it's something that I think people just don't see the value of and I'm hoping that your book really will make a difference and I think it will because I think it's you are someone who's very knowledgeable in this but I think that more people should realize how valuable this tool is I always look at YouTube yes. I said look YouTube I said look YouTube is think of a person okay YouTube to me is the heart of it all you know I use this tool to help spread the word about my book to help spread the word about Simply Lara which is why I did so well you know it's it's the foundation and it's also something that goes hand in hand with everything else I do so if you want to make this your full-time career I would say a wait it out don't plan on it and B you don't necessarily want to give up something you're doing for your YouTube channel solely figure out a way to make it work together that is to what you're doing that's that's you know the, the the best recipe right there. Awesome! This is like YouTube gold, literally coming from <laughs> some uh, successful YouTubers. But I would love to ask you some lightning round questions if you don't mind. Sure. They're real, real simple. I just give you two options and you just pick the one. 
Uh, first question is pizza or pasta? Pasta. Pizza. <laughs> I bet that's a fun conversation. Well, you can get both of those at home. Oh, yeah, unless restaurant. you're in Italy, then they, they have like the pizza restaurant and then they have the everything else restaurant. Yep. Yeah, and it's yeah. tough to get both a lot of times. Coke or Pepsi? Neither. Diet Coke. <laughs> um, dessert or appetizers? Ooh. I don't have to say appetizers. Me on that. too. Yeah. Because you have to start with it. I that? used to do this thing where I would actually order dessert at the beginning. I, I don't do that anymore. But oh, that's what like when I was 17. By the time dessert comes around, it's always You're no thank full. you because I'm full because I had too many appetizers. Yeah. Well, what's the last thing you grabbed out of the fridge? Uh, my salad. A beer. But that was yeah. yesterday. Yeah. <laughs> it's still early. It's still early. <laughs> Uh, last song you had on repeat on your iPod or iPhone or device? Oh, uh, mm. last song. Um, oh, uh, I can't think of the word. It's on Pandora. It's a ludicrous station, but it's an Eminem song with Dido, whatever her name is. It Stan. came on Stan. It that came was on, on like yours. a yeah. million times yesterday when I had it on. I'm not even joking. Probably ten times on repeat. I don't know why. I just had Pitbull Radio on on Pandora, so I don't know <laughs> what the last thing was that was on. Or, or DMX is your so oh, popularly yeah. known for. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Instagram or Snapchat? Instagram. Instagram. I don't have Snapchat. Yeah. New York or LA? New York. LA. What? <laughs> New York, I, it rains and snows too much, okay? Oh, okay. no, New York. Okay. Um, cat or dog? Dog. Dog. Pet peeve? Uh, a dirty house. Anything anything unorganized in my house is just, uh, like, even if I go to someone else's house and I see drawers that are a little bit open or cabinets that are a little bit open, I got I can't, I, yeah. my brain cannot function. I don't like it. Yeah, I don't like when that little piece of cloth it, or cloth is sticking out of the drawer and it's just not completely Oh, sharp. no, no. What would you say, Joe? I think blanket stealers are my pet peeve. People who take your no, blankets. No, you also don't like <laughs> when someone bites, or... bites their finger when they're nervous. That's another thing. Oh, wow. Nervous yeah. Bite. Favorite holiday? Christmas. Christmas, yeah. Uh, favorite snack? Oh, this is hard. Um, Salt and vinegar chips. Yeah. You're the same as that. Definitely. Yeah. If there's like, if there's something yeah. that I'm like I need this, it's, it's that's what it is. I don't know why this is on here, but Harry Potter or Hunger Games? Neither. I've never uh, seen. Well, I've either. never seen Hunger Games, so I guess I have to default to Harry Potter because it's the only one of the two I've seen. You have? Yeah. I didn't even know that. I never yeah. have. Favorite YouTube channel right now, other than your own? It's I have tricky. to say, it's Judy's life. Duh. That's my <laughs> default. That's well, my thank half time. you, thank you for that, when but I, uh, no. Yep, you know, when I, I hope you're saying that because what... that's what you really like. <laughs> I don't know that I have a favorite, but I like because I, I don't really. I, first of all, I have there's, I have a confession to make, and, I, and don't worry, the people at YouTube know this. I, I have zero subscriptions in my subscription box. Well, you don't. I browse. I'm a browser. Yeah. I'm not so much of a subscriber. Um, hold on, something will come to me. I don't know. Maybe it will. Maybe it won't. I can't think of anything. I, you know, Joe, I'm kind of like you. Unsubscribe to a lot of people, but I, I use YouTube more as a utility, like how right. to I do use stuff. it so much that if I subscribe, I'm bu I'll never get any work done. I shouldn't say that. I have channels. I have more than one channel. I have channels on which I subscribe to people, mm -hmm. but it's we share the main channel, so like yeah. a lot of my subscriptions yeah. are mixed in with Lars. But on my personal one, I use it as a as a tool. Anything I need to learn, I use it. It's like okay, I need to know how to do this. Oh, I will and, say my favorite latest thing, and it's probably so silly. Like when like if sometimes I'll put YouTube on and I don't even watch, but I like listening to things. My latest obsession has been putting on Dr. Phil. Dr. Phil, like there's a YouTube channel that uploads all of Dr. Phil's content, and I've been putting him on because his voice is very. I find his southern voice very soothing, which is probably yeah. weird. But that's probably the thing that I've been listening to the most has been his voice. Jimmy Fallon! Yeah, oh, yeah. yeah. That's the one. Yeah. Jimmy Fallon. Good, good. Thank you so much for being on here. Go to YouTube and just type in Laura. Most likely her channel is going to come up first. Uh, she also has her beauty channel as well as her vlog channel if you want to creep on their life, right? And then also go to the cooking channel. That's where Laura's show is at. Please, Laura and Joe, feel free to share with our audience, uh, you know, more about you, what's coming up in the near future. Well, I would say we have, so we have the cookbook is scheduled to, to release in the fall of 2015. The working title is Laura in the Kitchen. 
we hopefully will keep the same title throughout the process, but that's just how it is. Until it's published, we won't know for sure what the actual title will be. Um, we, I can't say much uh, on a couple other fronts there, but what I can say is make sure you uh, make sure you have the cooking channel at your house. <laughs> yep, yep. Um, and even if you if you have the cooking channel right now and and you want to watch Simply Laura, you just go through and find it. It's there's a lot of re reruns, reruns running right now. Mm -hmm. Um, and you can also go to, to the Cooking Channel's website, cookingchannel.tv.com, and search for my show Simply Laura to get all the recipes from the Simply Laura season one, uh, from the season one of Simply Laura, because those recipes are exclusive to Cooking Channel, so they are not found on Laura in the Kitchen, so they can be found on cookingchannel.tv.com. Give me a great ratings, because the higher the rating, the more it'll show up in, in search results. If you're looking for a specific recipe and I have it, it'll show up. Um, yeah, I think that's about it. Yeah, I would, I would say that, um, yeah, you pretty much nailed it. I mean, type yep. in Laura, and maybe you need Should to put I? a V on the end. You'll find Laura of Italian. <laughs> Thank you so much, Laura and Joe, for being on here. It was an honor. You guys are just like on the brink of something huge. So I feel lucky to have you on here, and hopefully the viewers here on Video Influencer thinks that this is of value, which I'm sure they will. Uh, is there any last thing that you want to say before we stop this broadcast? I think the last thing I would say is that just remember that the difference between myself and anyone else out there is that I went ahead and did it. Just so, do it. Just do it. Just put your fears aside, bring that passion out, and just do it. You'll never know what it can become unless you do it.